Okay, our uh, third item announcements. Uh, A announced the August 2021 20, 2024 public hearing at 5 30 p.m. For Chapter 112 Zoning and Chapter 66 Short Term Rentals. Uh, B announced purpose of the executive session scheduled for August 21st. That is legal matters related to our public hearing tomorrow night. Item four comments, suggestions, petitions by residents in attendance regarding items that are not on the agenda. Mr. Cook. Darrell Cook, South Walton Street. Does Westchester have plans on how to handle 60 cubic feet of water when West Goshen removes the dam on Montgomery Avenue? I don't know the answer to that, but we will uh, we'll find out from Mr. Anderson. Okay, uh, item five, reports and presentations. First one uh, being the Westchester Community Campus semester report to borough council by dr julie dietrich and mr don bracelin good evening i'm reporting out on uh, behalf of uh, mr bracelin and myself this evening about the achievements from the spring semester so um if you remember how we're reporting out is achievements things in process and then next steps so with um the spring semester, we had a move out give back where it impacted 50 properties and we had 230 donated items, um, pieces of furniture that went to the community warehouse project. That was something that we started recently and glad to say that that seems productive and thanks to our colleagues in public works that <laughs> worked with us on that. The other um, one of the other key achievements is my colleague and I from the university, Dr. Lexi McCarthy, presented a paper with Jordan Norley that was establishing a sustainable approach to campus and community partnership. So it was a big deal that it was accepted by the International Town Gown Association, indeed as a model. Uh, so to get it selected and then go and present that at the University of Maryland, um, not only that, I think to do that in tandem, but also to have the university support my colleague and I, and I wanna thank Sean um, Metric and the mayor who, um, the mayor also attended. So I thought it was pretty cool that you have a former and current mayor that did that, so, so thank you. And then with the onboarding, the, the coming in of uh, Chief Lee and Sally Sluk, we did from the university meet in general, but also specifically to make sure that those individuals were aware of the work of the committee and answer any questions that they might have. And then another thanks to our dear Bill Ratu, we had a nice feature article on the achievements of the uh, committee from the last time that I reported out. Some things in process, we're working to identify uh, the location of bike racks, both at the university and in the borough to help eliminate, you know, um, let me rephrase that, to really optimize an opportunity for those that ride bikes to have a place to put them. And if there are bikes left to get them donated. We're also working on, um, we want to work with Sally and, and she's aware of this and, and as appropriate, uh, the committee definitely wants to be supportive of understanding the property owner points program. And then something else with the uh, disruptive conduct reports to help make sure that I think that would be again mutually beneficial to both the university and the borough if we made sure that we were getting those reports and I think it would help with student accountability. And we do have the Center for Community Solutions. We're employing students and actually the Center for Community Solutions is housed within my office. So we employ students to work on community projects and we have two with the borough. One with the administration on helping to get accurate student rental property data. Again, mutually beneficial for us moving forward. And then also, and then we have three students that are being paid to, to work on that. So that's gonna be a process and their sensitivities around housing, but we're trying to get to some of the foundation of some of the, the challenges that that can um, generate. The other project is with Keith in the Department of Parks and Recreation, uh, in particular around the 225th anniversary, and we have a student working with him in that regard. This upcoming Friday, we have our second Welcome to the Borough event. So that's four to eight. 
please, please, please come and support. We do have the mayor coming from Port of Six, Ramy photos. We have the Chester County History Center. We're doing some tours. We're using the Chester County History Center as a resource fair for students. We're providing a shuttle to get the students in and out. We're working, um, again, a thank you to Dave March and helping to make sure that EMS, fire, and police have an opportunity to recruit and also engage in the community. Activation zones, so there's a lot there and I have flyers if, if someone's interested in, in learning more or to certainly contact me. Some next steps, one of the things that, especially as we had some new people coming in and we wanna hold ourselves accountable, we, and some measurables around that, we identified priority projects and then rank them via survey to that cohort. So we have that where we're, you know, assigning, in, well, not assigning as much as individuals where they feel like they have the most value to those, we have five for the academic year um, projects and then measurables outcomes that we're again, helping to hold everyone accountable on those. So I won't use the space to do that, but if anyone's interested in what the five are and how we're uh, again, measuring that engagement and what we hope to accomplish, more than happy to share that. We have two events coming up, one with uh, a meet and greet. You might have seen something go out on that, which is August 25th from two to four at Ruston Park. So again, that's borough neighbor, just as it says, a meet and greet. And then we also have on September 8th at two in Aspen Hall, we're really focusing on students, sports captains, Greek life um, presidents. So it's student based, but we have some of the committee members serving as panelists on that again, to help um, with intentionality around how we work together in the community. And then lastly, we have the president, vice president of student affairs, both of whom are new, and uh, vice president for university advancement and external affairs coming to a, an upcoming meeting. So it was a request of the committee in particular to meet with the president and incoming new student affairs VP. So we are honoring that and we're getting them on board. So I try to keep it short and sweet, but if you have any questions, you know how to reach me. Thank you. Any questions? Appreciate it. Great updates. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, 5B, 5 North Adam Street, zoning matter. Mr. President, if I may, just before we get started, for the benefit of council, borough council, um, the applicant is coming today to give you a brief introduction of what the project is about and there's no matter before council to make a decision on at your September meeting uh, uh, we'll be able to make a decision on whether we direct the solicitor or not to attend the uh, zoning hearing and, and what we would uh, instruct the solicitor to do in that matter but we thought it prudent to have the applicant come and familiarize council with the project and the issues that are at hand with the pending zoning hearing so that's why Brian Nagel and the team are here tonight. Thank you, Sean. Good evening, members of council. Brian Nagel on behalf of the uh, development team for the redevelopment of the Adam Street property. Uh, as you may know, as Sean alluded to, um, we have a special exception application that's pending with the zoning hearing board, and that will be reviewed by you next month before it goes to in front of the zoning hearing board. This month, we just wanted to come and provide an overview of the project which entails the redevelopment of the property that's across, obviously across the street from where we are here at Borough Hall uh, that fronts on Gay, Adams, and Market Streets. I think you're all familiar with it. Um, the proposal is for a 329 unit apartment and retail mixed use project that's permitted by right by your ordinances. Um, the project also falls uh, squarely within the goals of your comprehensive plan uh, to revitalize, and you'll hear a little bit about this during our slide presentation, um, to revitalize the C CS district as a more pedestrian friendly part of the borough, rather than primarily automobile uh, equipment and um, fast food retail. Uh, that's one of the goals in your comp plan. Uh, you will hear a lot tonight about the benefits that stem from this project. And we think and hope that you'll agree that this project is not just something that should be approved as permitted by your ordinances, but also as a project that's worthy of your support. It will at last get the subject property beneficially redeveloped and go towards establishing the envisioned gateway to the borough 
save a lot of taxpayers dollars and also drive a lot of dollars to uh, the borough. We will welcome your questions and comments, uh, but as Sean mentioned, there's no action required by council tonight. So with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Pete Staz and, and we'll kind of go back and forth and Denny Howell is with us tonight to talk a little bit about these subjects. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. Is there, does that point to? There we go. Okay. Mm. Great. Thank you. So, um, we're going to try to keep this relatively brief, but, um, uh, I just wanted to introduce a few, uh, the team members, um, the, on the development side, um, there's three parties involved, uh, core development, which I think most of you are familiar with, um, um, with some of the projects we've been doing in town. Um, then you have the Michaels organization, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then, um, Gunner properties, um, they've been in town for decades. They own the site and they're participating in the development of it. Uh, and then of course our project team, um, which speaks for itself. We did not put Bernardin on there, not purposely. We just didn't have space on the page and they're not here, but they're gonna be involved with it, so. Um, Michael's, uh, j just a brief intro on them, but um, they're nationwide. They're out of Camden, uh, New Jersey. Um, many of their executives are local to um, Chester County, Delaware County, Philadelphia area. Um, and they've been around for 50 years, um, a, a very large company, um, but we we met them a, around five years ago and have really were enticed to them by their reputation. But as we got to know the people that work there, that's really why we're working with them. And really the collective development team with brings a broad knowledge with their knowledge, our knowledge, and the gunner's knowledge um, and a local community, understanding what the community wants and needs because of the locality of core and the, uh, the gunner folks. Uh, Brian's gonna talk about these couple slides. So like I said, I think you're, I think you're familiar with the, with the site conditions, but just a brief overview. Um, there you can see uh, looking looking down at, at the site and they've kind of highlighted it so you can see where the, where the boundaries of the development property are located. Um, here's a view obviously looking as you're coming down Gay Street towards Borough Hall, which would come up on your right and on your left. Obviously this is what we have today and really this doesn't even reflect if you look out there today, there's a lot more equipment. You've got unstabilized ground um, there along Market Street where they store a lot of equipment behind the Knox facility that's there. Uh, this is a little bit further down Market Street. On the other side of this intersection, obviously you have the um, the Memorial um, Pocket Park that's here on the borough property. <clears throat> this is opposite of that corner. Um, and we all know that this has been used for um, Christmas tree sales, fireworks sales, and things like that off and on from year to year for quite a long time. Here you have a view um, around, you can kind of see at the top image, you can see obviously the, the automobile reservice service shop that's fronts on Adams Street and some of that that continues up Adams Street as you head north towards Borough Hall. And then you can see starting down further down Market Street uh, in both pictures. And there you see the, the corner of the automobile repair and the buggy wash. Um, so that's just kind of an overview of what's there today that we're trying to um, redevelop. Yeah, okay. Oh, this is what I was, this is what I referred to uh, in the introduction. On the left, the smaller print is taken directly from your comprehensive plan. And you can see, I won't go through all of it, but if, if you read through this and you can see um, the recommendations of the, the changes that were made to the CS district that allow this project, they wanted to discour discourage new single purpose, audio auto oriented and fast food retail services, um, complete tree and streetscape improvements, enhance the overall 
uh, appearance. And you'll see as we go through the development project slides that this, accomplish, this project would accomplish all of that. Um, and then we, we have kind of a summary <clears throat> and, and an important theme here. And obviously I think council understands this kind of a project at this location is going to enhance and elevate the whole surrounding real area. So we would expect that all of the surrounding retail um, would would rise up as a result of this project. You, you would have a new host of um, borough residents who would be in this area, who would be there to utilize those services, thereby forcing those services to elevate and, and meet the needs. In addition to creating this awesome pedestrian corridor, both on Gay Street and Market Street that would that would be the start of accomplishing the vision that was that was developed by the folks who wrote the comprehensive plan and by Borough Council when it adopted the zoning. This is the this is commercial service district HO seventy five. You're familiar with the different HO districts in the borough. We've had a few projects come under those. Uh, this is under the HO 75, 329 units, as I said, 5,000 square feet anticipated of retail. And as you know, there's a portion of the site along Market Street that does lie within the floodplain. Today, there's um, automobile service and the buggy wash, and some of those buildings are in the floodplain today. Um, fiscal impact, we've talked a little bit about this previously, but to the borough alone, it amounts to almost $800,000 annually between the property taxes and the borough share of the uh, earned income tax. Uh, so that's, that's annual, almost $800,000 to the borough. And then in addition to that, with very few, very few school students, you're looking at over $800,000 to the schools, additional funds also to the county. And then you've got one-time fees all the way over on the right, totaling almost $3 million just for the development of the the project. We don't have a lot, really enough time to walk through the whole building, but I'll just try to give you a summary. We tried to make this as simple as possible. We will have a rendering at some point, um, but th this is a, a pretty simple way to look at it. This would be your first, this would be at the ground level. Um, and you would have an amenity area, a proposed retail area, which is proposed at 5,000 square feet. There's actually an entrance off of Gay Street here, which goes up into upper, upper, upper level parking, which I'll show you in a, in a second. Um, and then you have, this is accessed off of Market Street with all this parking here. And then you'd have this, uh, we'll, we'll go over this later, but the open courtyard and um, a number of different amenities around the building. Um, all this parking is shielded. Um, so it'll appear as a building uh, on the outside. So it's not a surface lot. Um, and then um, of course we have about 17,000 square foot of amenity, including this open courtyard, which is about 14,000 square feet. Um, uh, this would be kind of the shape of the building as you get to the upper floors. Um, we do have, there's, there's a few levels of parking on the second and third floor. And then when you get to these upper floors, you have this courtyard and residential above. Um, and then we would have 383 spots, including that ground level and then the structured parking above. Um, I'll just actually, actually show you on here real quick. This, this would be our loading area right here. And when you go to here, this is just a snapshot of it. You would, it would be all off street loading for the moving, the, um, the, for any moving vehicles, trash, um, we'll have room for, it's about 50 feet of width there, 50 to 60 feet of width. So you'll be able to get. You know, the Amazon trucks in there, mail people, maybe a visitor spot. So all that will be off of Market Street, all off street and tucked away. Um, in regards to parking, um, as we've already completed a traffic study, a parking study, 
or um, so we have a, a letter produced by Matt Hammond and TPD. Um, and this is kind of an, a summary of that. Um, we applied the uh, dense multi-use urban setting and utilize the ULL sh shared parking, which is suggested in the borough ordinance, um, which would require 343 parking spots. We have 383, which would suggest you have a surplus of 40 spots. The other thing I would mention is on Market and Gay Street, on the frontage of our property, we have ample off-street parking. Um, so there's a, just, just on those two blocks, there's 20, 23, 24 spots just on our frontage. If you go across the street, obviously there's more. Um, this is just a summary of some of the architectural elements at the ground level. You have a plaza here, um, the urban park and the linear rain garden. Um, grab my notes here on the, so, so this is a design that was done by the tree commission in 2022, 2021. And it was, I think it was approved um, through the planning commission and then borough council, but this was a proposed linear park. Um, and it's, that's borough hall right there. And this would be our site here. And they proposed a linear park there. Um, and again, the, the whole idea behind this was to beautify the gateway into the borough um, make it more pedestrian friendly that all the things tied back to the comp plan. So what we're proposing is a linear garden on this side. So this is the shape of our building here. There's Borough Hall. This would be a linear park, which we would call it a linear rain garden uh, park uh, because that is in the floodplain. Um, so we think it's a really appropriate place to put it. Um, and that, just to kind of give you a perspective that that's, uh, uh about 8,000 square feet of space. Um, this is, a the plaza across the street. It would mirror the, the Memorial park, which is right on the corner here. Um, and that these are just some inspirational images of what that could look like, um, activate the space again, make it pedestrian friendly. And then we're, we're calling this an urban park. Again, this is a, a pretty sizable space. Um, this would be right up against borough hall. And obviously we would green it and <clears throat> make it, um, pedestrian friendly and also put all kinds of interesting things in there, whether it's art or, um, Lots of seating, et cetera. So Pete, we would work with the tree commission on, on, on the tree elements of both of those. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then this is, this would be, uh, a common area provided to the tenants of the building, but this is the space. that's about 14,000 square feet. that's in the courtyard below that. We would actually have all our stormwater and, um, stormwater management for the new construction of the building. But um, above that, we would have greening and, and lots of things for our tenants. And this would be Denny. Thanks, Pete. Good evening, everybody. My name is Denny Howe with Howe Engineering. You're probably used to seeing Joe here, not me. That They don't let me out that much. But um, we have studied the floodplain that exists. And I've done this a few times for this project. Um, I'm sure the borough knows this section of Goose Creek. Where's the button here? That's just, the, just the forward and back there. Forward there. and back one. Oh, but which one does the pointer? Uh, On the top? Show me the pointer, Brian. Oh, right there, I got you. I got you. I got you. Um, we've, we've studied this floodplain a number of times. As, as the borough is familiar, we did the Rubenstein project just to the west of here and just slightly to the south. Obviously, this is the same reach of Goose Creek. It comes down through everyone knows that this area floods when it comes down through here. I think the 1 gentleman um, earlier asked in public comment if we have considered what West Goshen is doing up on Montgomery Avenue. I did have a conversation uh, with the township engineer there. West Goshen has a grant that they are going to try to expand that box culvert that's kind of behind Parkway and behind McDonald's. There's not a lot of room there to 
I mean, there's there's no ability to com completely convey this, the 100 year storm in the culvert. So what they're really going to achieve is hopefully a little less water on the streets. But when we get the large flooding events, obviously everyone sees the area that flows behind Taco Bell overwhelms the two existing 48 by 84 inch corrugated metal pipes. Once they get overwhelmed, we're then in a surface flow condition and it flows above that through the parking lot along along Market Street and then on this slide here, we don't show it, but it goes um, in a different order. We highlight the area, but it also floods across Market Street and to the south. So similar to what we did for uh, the Rubenstein um, project to the, to the west, we've studied this floodplain. We do have the opportunity to put in a slightly larger culvert that would allow us to convey some more runoff through the area of the site instead of having the two 48 by 84 inch corrugated metal pipes that are kind of in disrepair and clogged up. We tried to put our pipe camera through it and we couldn't even really get through it. There's so much debris inside of it with sticks and trees and shopping carts. The box culvert um, will be a slightly larger opening and will afford us the ability. We have two vaults on, on it at its turn and where it connects to market to allow us to be able to maintain and clean that. But more importantly, what it does for the floodplain is right now, the existing Buggy wash is actually outside of the studied 100 year floodplain, but the old the old Carlson's uh, building, the building that's to the rear of that or to the north and then the auto repair on the corner. Those buildings are all situated in the floodplain. So when Goose Creek overwhelms that culvert and it flows down through these become obstructions in the floodplain and they're contributing to shifting that flooding further across Market Street and further to the south down there. So. And what we are proposing, in addition to one, increasing the size of that culvert from being those two corrugated metal pipes to a box, while that helps, what truly helps is getting those obstructions out of the calculated 100 year floodplain. So on this slide, it's kind of, for me, it jumps out, but we show in little purple, those are just all of the columns that are supporting our building. So the total area of them, and I, I quickly, I think we have it on our one sheet. We have about 14,000 square feet of obstruction in the floodplain existing today. And we're going to go to about 700 square feet of obstruction, which makes a big difference. It ends up lowering the floodplain elevation um, significantly and slowing it down. There's no way for us to be able to get all of the water underground and not still have it go across the surface. There's just, it's just too much, you know, unfortunately. The whole area upstream and everyone knows I always get blamed. I did the, we did the LA fitness. Everyone said, you know, well, LA fitness went in Denny, you flooded the whole borough out. And we're like, no, nah, probably everything got cleaned out up there when they did the LA fitness. But um, this is a, this is a huge improvement by putting in the box, especially because we don't really know how well this would function if, if it were cleaned out and we can't really get in it to really clean it out, which is what really needs to be done. So having it as a box culvert, Having these two ports that are on the plan right before we connect the market street and right where we change direction to be able to clean this out and maintain it will be will be vitally important. In addition to getting all of the the structures that are in the floodplain now out of the floodplain. Danny, can I just ask you two questions about the corrugated pipes and the box culvert? Sure. Just to make sure it's clear, the, the two corrugated pipes run under the site today, correct? Correct. And so with this project, they would be replaced with the larger single box culvert that would be concrete right yes four and a half by 16. and is there is there a difference in terms of the obviously that's a huge infrastructure improvement in and of itself but is there a difference between the two corrugated pipes versus the box culvert in terms of the ability to function with ongoing maintenance yeah and that's what i was saying we can obviously get to that box and maintain it more get down inside of it the pipes are, are not even accessible right now like I said, if, if they could be cleaned out, we would probably get a dramatic improvement on what goes on there today, but. And you can ask a question. So will yep. It is, it's under the building. Yeah, and it's through that surface parking area that's under the building and it, the podium columns span that box culvert. How will you get, how will you get to maintain that, get into it under the building? We could, because that, that area of the, I know it's kind of confusing. That area part of the building is is accessible because that's where our driveway entrance is in there to get in there to park cars. So you can get a truck in there to open this up. I mean, unfortunately, no matter what, whether this was an open field, there's no way to get a piece of equipment down inside here. So just having like an access port to put a man down inside of 
some of the hand work to get there and clean that thing out. That's really the only way to maintain it. But this is not, not much different than Rubenstein's, although Rubenstein's we actually surveyed. We could actually get up in the Rubenstein culvert and we surveyed our way up through there and it was much more open than what these two pipes are, are today. So that's like the 50,000 foot version of 100 year floodplain. We, uh, of course, we did a study. It was submitted to the borough engineer. Um, they've done a review and we know we'll be working with them through that, but we luckily have the benefit of having studied Goose Creek all through here. I actually did the testimony for AutoZone. I didn't design it, thank God, but I did the work on that. One, one more question. Are, are the, the corrugated pipes tend to catch things because they're corrugated, is that right? And because it's two holes rather than one. And are they currently past their useful life or? Yes. They are. Okay. That's a that's a quick. I know we have a short time frame, so I just was wanting to hit on. Just a, a quick question about that. So, is that uh, an easement, or is that something that's owned by the borough, the the culvert, or is that on the property and owned by the whoever owns the property? What's existing? Yeah. What's existing is part of the, the borough's. The borough stormwater's it's 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 a stream in a pipe essentially to that, and that's what it would continue to be. It's just that right now you can't get in there to maintain it. The debris gets clogged in there because the pipes are corrugated, and then in addition to that, they're degrading. We don't know to what extent because we couldn't get in. Getting there inside because of them, it's yeah. So clogged up, but this would enable the removal of those, the installation of a brand new concrete. Box culvert that could be accessed and maintained moving forward. Okay. I have sort of a very far out concern of maintenance of our entire borough. And I am very concerned about things like rain gardens and cleaning out these culverts because. You know, we, we need to plan as a borough, not necessarily you guys specifically, but we need to plan as an entire group how we're going to do this very consistently. Because if we, if we don't, we're going to end up in the same position. We're going to set ourselves up for this again. And, and we really need to be doing this. So I'm talking to you guys, but I'm also talking to Sean uh, and everybody over there. Um, the, this, I want this as much in writing and figured out planned ahead to be maintained so the the i love all the rain gardens all all of this planning is beautiful and amazing and i want it all to happen but i also want to know what the six months plan is the five-year plan the 10-year plan i want to know how we're going to continue to maintain this and make sure it's all functioning moving forward sheila that's important first step is getting the infrastructure upgraded so you have something that's maintainable To the extent that anything they're proposing is a BMP that's required under your stormwater ordinance, your stormwater ordinance already requires the developers to maintain that. And there's a stormwater management agreement that gets recorded with the plan that shifts all of the maintenance obligations to the developer and to the property owner in perpetuity. But with respect, what I'm confused about is the culvert. So, Patrick, to answer your question, I think it depends on what the records show as far as, you know, past development plans and what we've seen is that prior, like older subdivision plans, land development plans from the 70s and even the 80s weren't good about identifying, first of all, do they even show the pipes? And two, do they identify who owns the pipe? And three, do they say who maintains it? And in most cases with older developments, you don't have that information, but the DEP often takes the position that culverts and streams are the responsibility of a municipality. But I think as part of this conversation, we're gonna have to have a conversation about once you replace that, if you replace that, I should say, those two corrugated pipes with this box culvert, well, then who's responsible for that? And that's something that I think I agree with you, Sheila, is something that absolutely has to be a conversation and recorded in the chain of title to the property. Follow up on Kristen, back to what you asked about, Patrick. Hey, there's really no is your record to speak of. It's just, it's there and it's part of the stream system. And so that that I mean those are all good points that have to be would have to be addressed. But once built, that that culvert 
would be maintained by the property owner. That, that would have to be that would have to be worked out, like Kristen's saying, during the during the land development process for the project. We 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 don't know because there's no record today uh, of. I mean, right now it's really just part of the borough stream. So we, we have to work that out. And Sheila's right, we'd have to have a plan for the future. But at least you've had you'd have an infrastructure part of this. You know, West Goshen's doing what it's doing. You've got Rubenstein's project, which will upgrade this problematic conveyance system that we have with old infrastructure. And then you've got this, and the, the maintenance of it has to be worked out. But at least you'll have an infrastructure that's maintainable. Uh, regardless of who does that's the that's the biggest thing right now it's almost not maintainable without putting a man down inside of there and confined space and trying to pull out the, everything that's in it which is almost is very difficult and danny would you agree that w once it's in and new it's not really that hard to maintain as long as you do it on a regular basis yeah we we place two two concrete vaults one right there just just north of market street where it goes across and one at the change in direction with an access port so that you can get down in there and get a pipe truck in and vac it out because it would need we have a pipe storage system we're in west goshen of course by the reservoir and we maintain our pipe storage system we try to once a year and there's a massive amount of debris that gets sucked out of it if you don't do it it will eventually clog up so sure i think what you're saying i just want <clears throat> and, and i would be aligned to is that you know, we've got you, you've named all these Rubenstein's. We've got five Adam street. We've got West Goshen and we need to connect the dots and make sure strategically that we're not just protecting the properties that are being enhanced or built, but all the surrounding properties as well. Right? And I agree that, you know, if we don't have document or a precedent, so to speak around, you know, because we don't have any documentation here, you know, we need to make sure going forward that we're protecting residents, uh, you know, that, you know, there's a lot of interest now in the East end, right? Because it's the only place that's undeveloped quite frankly. <laughs> um, so, and this is where all the water has gone historically. So I agree with you. And, you know, we have where this, and then can show on here, where, where this outfalls, you've got some, some backed up infrastructure on the other side of market street that also needs to be looked at and cleaned out. So that's something that's going to have to be considered as as we progress because that's part of it as well. Just want to make sure we're we're sharing the the wealth, so to speak, right? And and looking at it holistically and not piecemeal. Yep. One quick question, man, and, and Don, you can ask your your question or your comment. Uh, you, you mentioned that the culvert's going to be slightly larger. Yep. And so is it sized for what's coming in or is it sized for what's on the site? It's sized for basically the largest that we could fit in that area where it exists today that's more efficient. Unfortunately, we don't have the opportunity, really no one does now, to put a culvert in that would convey what the flow is. So it's sized to be larger and to be as large as it can be to fit in the confines of what we've got because we still have to make the connection down down to Market Street and then on down through down to Rubenstein's and they're just not the ability, unfortunately, to make it one large enough. You would really have a bridge to span this area. So it's larger, but but really that's not the real benefit. The real benefit is getting the, the obstructions out of the floodplain. That's really what is displacing the surface water that, that, we're can, that we're faced with being our only conveyance facility. Once it overwhelms the culvert, it's on the surface. And when there's buildings in the way, it can't go anywhere but out in the street and further. And this is exactly like I said, the, the auto zone example. It was built up higher and that was great for them, but then it ended up pushing all the flooding all the rest of the way. In this case, getting these obstructions out of the floodplain will be a big help. And it's a big, it's a, it's a large decrease, like 14,000 square feet of obstruction down to 780 square feet of, of, of obstruction. So you have all that surface now available for conveyance. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mr. Edwards. Um, since I've been here, I've been looking at Goose Creek hard, and um, I, I think I have some information that's relevant uh, to the discussion. Um, there, whoever said that, you know, we got all these little different things going up and down Goose Creek, you know, all needs to be put together. 100% agree. Okay. So, um, one thing is the last time Goose Creek was studied, 
um, was over 50 years. There was a 2018 update, but there was never a, a, what's called a hydraulic analysis and engineering study for the creek, and it's and it's badly needed. Um, when we went to West Goshen for their proposed hotel at 205 Carter Drive, um, they did a flood map revision, and they went out there and they did surveying, and and they found out that the flood maps, including the surveying, are all messed up, and I totally believe that uh, from what I've seen. So um, what we're talking about here ties into the overall plan, which is really needed. I've already emailed all of you on Mr. Cook's question. I'll say it here. As when West Goshen, they try to eliminate that bottleneck at Gay Street near Montgomery, they are going to have to do a flood study and they are going to have to address the downstream impacts, including any mitigation of that. They might have to do some other improvements. I'm sorry if I'm confusing you, but there's just all this, this stuff and I'd be happy to answer questions later if you have any questions, but, but, but nothing's, I mean, you don't just go in there and add box culverts. We've met with them once with West Ocean. We're going to meet with them again. I'm sure as there's more planning, more design before they actually do that project, but all these things tie together. Um, I have asked, um, in the budget is, is this is just preliminary and draft right now, but I've asked for um, a study that would go from route 202 to Lacey street for a hydraulic study. You start at the downstream end, you get things opened up and then you move your way upstream and in all this work, including this right here, uh, needs to be considered. Um, I understand they, uh, I know that, um, DL Hal did, um, some hydraulic work for Rubenstein's like you mentioned. And so they've already done some of this, uh, the engineer for that proposed hotel hotel in West Goshen, they've already done some of this, uh, and there's other work and, and West Goshen is going to do it for gay street here. So I, I just want to, um, I guess, emphasize that this is a comprehensive issue. I think it's very solvable, you know, it just needs to be done the right way so that we connect all the dots and uh, that's kind of where we are and it ties in with what we're talking about right here. Mr. Edwards, a yeah. uh, question. So are you suggesting that perhaps the builders here need to speak with West Goshen and speak with uh, um, Westchester U on their projects? Uh, and look at these hydraulic studies, the pieces of it that have been done and do their own hydraulic study as well. I, I would suggest that we need to coordinate all of this work, whether it's whether it's through a comprehensive study. Like I mentioned, I, I, I want to do from 202 to Lacey Street. Um, I think there ne needs to be another part from Lacey Street back to past Gay Street. I think all of that needs to be coordinated. Um, I understand there's flooding underneath the railroad bridge on Barnard, Barnard Street. You know, that needs to be considered. Um, so, yes, I am suggesting that we do need like a comprehensive coordinated plan that allows all this. And it's very doable. And I think it would be very productive um, for all the development that we're talking about. And it would, I, I'm very confident it would fix the flooding problems that we have. I, I can tell you this. Uh having a business across the street from the buildings that were built uh, for Leslie Pinckney Hill Commons apartments, uh, as much as whatever was decided by the borough then, I know it was a different um, borough manager and different leadership completely, but whatever was agreed upon was not sufficient um, because two things happened. One, they went to dig and then we had a rain yeah. and then it took another month or two before they could dig again because the water filled up the hole so bad mm -hmm. that they couldn't even sump pump it out right and it stayed there for a month or more yeah. secondly they've already had flooding uh this year uh, over there so whatever was done was not sufficient and i think we need to look at those plans yes. so that 
the minimum is not done this time. And I'm not suggesting you have planned the minimum. What I'm saying is whatever that maximum looks like, it needs to happen because property around there, neighbors, including us, uh, have been negatively impacted from uh, the buildings because, you know, when they dig, dug and when they used the jackhammer, you know, we believe that uh, our foundation of our building was uh, compromised because now we feel uh, what are coming up through the, our concrete because we don't have a basement. Uh, and, and that has been since the building, uh, right. building of these buildings. Well, so whatever was done then, and I'd like us to look at that to make sure that that's, we're doubling down our efforts to make sure that Right. If this moves forward, it moves forward in the most judicious way possible. Right. It's 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 definitely these these projects are not going to fix the problem. Uh, they they could they could help it a little. They could hurt it a little. But the but the solution is what I believe I've I've said, which is you got to work downstream, work your way your way up. You cannot look at this individually. It's got to be as a whole, and. Uh, it, you know, I, I don't know if I sound arrogant or not, but I spent eight years in South Louisiana where, you know, near New Orleans. And so, you know, I've, uh, I've, I've seen a lot of drainage and, and I'm pretty confident that this is what is needed here. And so to Sheila's point, we just have to make sure that, you know, all I's are dotted, T's are crossed and everything possible. Cause I've seen the water run down market street in waves. Yep and meet the water from Worthington Street in waves to the point that it comes up on Worthington Street yep. up onto our berm. So and the, re the reason why that's happening in I waves is, like it's a <laughs> is what I'm saying. It's, you know, you got like we had a bunch of trees in Goose Creek down in West Goose and we got them out and I'm, I'm seeing evidence. I'm waiting for like a five inch rain, but I'm seeing evidence that getting all those trees out of there has allowed the water to flow. Um, and, and, and that's the kind of thing we need to do up and down the Creek, connect the dots so that, you know, we have a comprehensive plan. Once the goose Creek is flowing without flooding. All this other stuff, I think it's going to clear, clear up. So, so how long does a study like that take? Well, um, I would say probably about 6 months. I mean, the way that we have it planned right now, and actually, uh, Mr. Klein from Pannoni is 1 of the 2 proposals we got. Um, I would say probably about six months in, and the first part would be just uh, doing some surveying, running the computer model, seeing, you know, what the existing conditions are, you know, along that stretch of Goose Creek, and then they'll come back and they'll say, you know, your, your flood maps, which I already know are, are messed up, okay? You, this is what your flood maps say. This is what the real data shows. Okay. And like right now, the flood maps show that green field ball field is like half covered with water. Uh, I don't believe that that's correct. When you look at the surveying, it probably may be happening now, but that's only because of the trees and everything. So, but so the first phase would be just like, here's our existing conditions. And then the second phase would be, hey, do we want to, um, do we want to design something? Do we want to go for grants, you know, to construct this thing? So that, that would be the sequence there. If that makes sense. Is that okay? I have yes. a question. For Mr. Howe, the uh, can you put back up the the where the pipe is supposed to look in the, in the that one. Uh, that we can start there. Yep. Okay. Working from there back to the other side of Market Street. Okay, going uh, north in the market under the ground. Yes. All right. Um, is the builder willing to clean that out as well so we know that the new pipe and everything he's putting in there will have uh, a clean run from what 25 feet 30 feet the width of uh, market street that way there uh, this side of the road is uh we know it's we did his side we want to make sure that the, it's contiguous all the way through yeah it's something that we've been looking into we are actually trying to get yep. some costs from some subs through the, the how guys so now looking at those pipes right there they're corrugated so as mr uh Nagel was saying the corrugated stuff is is um not good right uh you know, so uh 
to Ms. Dorsey's point, to the mayor's point, to Mr. Edwards's point, uh, we're going to fix stuff on the other 25 feet away. It's going to start. Is it going to start getting clogged on our side that we're, that we're going to be responsible for? Well, and uh, right, gonna, yeah, right there, yep. you, right there, and then you got 25 feet across the street, right, right which there. is all corrugated. Right. So I was, I was going to say, you have to be careful. Well, well, we definitely can fix the problem. And I can study the whole floodplain, and as you, as, as the previous gentleman suggested, we have already studied a lot of this reach and. FEMA does this at a very high level. So not to say that our maps are wrong, but they're not getting the survey data and the base information that we get when we're surveying on the ground. The problem becomes, while we can solve what, you'll, what we're going to find out when we study this whole reach or whoever does it is that everything is undersized. And that's why we're seeing everything on the surface. Because as soon as these subsurface uh, facilities get overwhelmed. Can you say that again so the mayor? Yeah. Everything is under. Everything is undersized. It yeah. just okay. it is. And in, and in the days of, of PennDOT, uh, for all the roads, PennDOT doesn't design for what the 100 year storm. Most roads are 10 or 25. I 95 is still a 50 year storm. So when we start applying 100 year storm flows to existing stormwater pipes and existing roads from maybe 50 years ago, they're all undersized. And the reason that we know they're undersized, not just by calculation, but we're we're seeing all the surface water, right? Once all those under underground pipes can't ha handle any more flow, the water has nowhere to go but on the surface. But the problem is that there is some inherent stormwater management that is existing by that. So while I would agree, it would be ideal to study all the way up behind the Kmart and start opening up areas, you, you are introducing much more flow and what we call the time of concentration, the time for it takes the furthest raindrop that hits the ground at the hydraulically most distant point to flow. So that's when you have people that are downstream in the reach who maybe don't get as flooded out. Maybe the water dissipates by then, but as we, well, I don't disagree, it would be ideal to increase all of those reaches and all of those pipes. We are then introducing the ability for water to get downstream, runoff to get downstream faster. So it is like kind of opening up a Pandora's box. While I, it's not ideal to try to do ones in, in between, the reality of it is as we increase the pipe sizes, and I talked to Brian Kolakowski at West Goshen, I know him well about Montgomery Avenue and just said, what are you looking to achieve back there? Because are you gonna be punting more water down into the borough because if you are like we're going to have something to say about it. the Rubenstein's culvert is designed a certain way but but the reality of it is whether that that culvert is one size or another it's getting overwhelmed the water is then going across the surface and finding its way but it's going there at a slower rate if we keep it all underground and we keep it all in a pipe or all in a channel it's going to get there faster which is totally fine from an engineering perspective but it will result in more water getting downstream as as, as the borough knows all these storms that we've that we've received, and I, I I've sat on the board of the Chester County Water Resources Authority for 16 years, and we've sat there and decided: do we redefine the 100-year storm? You know, do we? Because we're getting all these storms, we don't get them every 100 years. We get them like every summer or a couple times a summer. But what we're really getting is not more rain. We're getting more rain faster. So instead of getting seven inches of rain in 24 hours, we're getting like six and a half inches of rain in three hours. So it's the intensity and the frequency. And if we, if you start to create the ability for that water to be conveyed more efficiently downstream, it is going to, it will just continue its problem as it goes downstream. So it's a very tough problem to solve. It's not a hard problem to study it and not a hard problem for us to be like, this is oversized, this is undersized, that's undersized, and maybe there's improvements that can be made within the reach. But just wholesale making that whole reach better as you go downstream, it's kind of like being the city of Coatesville and being at the, at the bottom end of the Hibernia Dam. I mean, the, the area down there where the flats is, that area can be washed out and Luke and Steel gone if that flow could all get down there unobstructed. So it, it's, a, it's a tough problem. To I'm, glad, I'm glad to hear the developers willing to uh, look at cleaning out so his system works properly. Yes. The extra 25 feet, and then our team can probably take over from there. But thank when you. When he walked up, I said, just say yes, because that's like one of the biggest things yeah. is to have that have that area to be able to be maintained. Right now it's getting zero maintenance. So. Thank you. So can I ask Mr. Ron, are you proposing to do, I know that Mr. Edwards talked about the 205 um, Matt Lex Creek Hotel. They did a club mark. Is this, does this project have any map provisions with FEMA? It would. It would. Yeah, because we said it. Okay. Yep. So I don't know if everybody understands that and I don't fully really understand it either, but as what he said, uh, um, FEMA maps are not always based on studied and surveyed lines. 
But when you do, when a project comes in and they actually survey it and can tell you where the floodplain lines are, they submit that information to FEMA. And then that is a letter, what's called a letter of map revision. So then it actually, if FEMA studies that and agrees with your survey information, they then that effectively changes the flood map boundaries on this particular property. So as part of this process, that's something that they would be doing. They would be submitting that studied floodplain to FEMA. And then if FEMA agrees, it would change the designation and the boundaries of the floodplain as it relates to this property. So that's a benefit in terms of then you really have a studied floodplain. It's not just based on what a FEMA map 50 years ago estimated it to be. Council, any other questions? Yeah, one, so does FEMA, do, do they redo the map based off of the proposed future plan and is it only for that property or are they redoing the map for all the areas surrounding the property? Yeah, they would, yeah, that's a good question. And they would, they would, in theory, they will revise their map. They don't revise it as often as we would like them to be revised, but there's, at the county, we have a, a great GIS website, but. They may not revise the map, but when you go into the actual flood profile, you can click on it. You can see that there was a Loma, a letter of map amendment, or a Clomar, and you can click on that, and then you can see the study, and then you get the benefit of seeing that that section, that reach, was studied of the stream. Like I said, I don't disagree. It would be ideal to study the whole reach, but we would study it and see that everything's undersized, and the solution would not be an easy one without introducing more water downstream. Okay, just to follow up. Faster question if, if for this project in particular it would result in getting the the new studied area that would up, be updated on the FEMA map and it also results in a reduction of the overall floodplain area. it does yep it reduces both the flood elevation and the width of the floodplain there as well because it's being conveyed more efficiently and I think your question was that's after so they study it and say okay with these proposed changes taking down the three buildings that they've described as obstructions and replacing it with the proposed development they provide the information as to what they believe the floodplain will look like and then after it's built they have to send in the supporting survey information to demonstrate that that really happened and then that's when fema officially changes their flood map okay yeah but sense, the, did i may say that right that's correct okay the, my the, along with that though my question was does that only happen for the property or will that happen so it's not going to happen for like milestones or yeah or it's it's just, just the property so the impacts to the rest of the area around going back to what lisa and everybody was saying could maybe the map won't be updated but in fact their floodplains get worse yeah, okay got it that and that's that's a fair statement so we're required by fema to show to demonstrate that we are not increasing the flood elevation off off of our property, whether it be downstream or whether it be on either side of it. So if you imagine, if let's say we were in here proposing to fill in the whole floodplain with our building and not do it that way, it would be impossible for me to show by calculation that I'm not shifting the floodplain across Market Street and to the south onto that property that, down there. So that's, but there's no way to show without saying the whole reach what the effects are all the way downstream. We have to be able to show that we are not increasing the flood elevation off of our property on anyone else's property, if that makes sense. And maybe Nate could help on this. Nate, isn't that a requirement too for the special exception that they have to demonstrate that whatever they're proposing won't increase the flood elevation? So that's a special exception criteria that your own ordinance requires them to demonstrate. And your, your own engineer would have to review what they've provided to see if they concur with that evaluation yeah. correct so really the next step here guys is going to be zoning hearing board variances special exception necessary for the proposed features in the floodplain as part of that they'll be doing the fema study we'll be reviewing that ultimately fema will re re review that they'll get a conditional approval then later they'll get a final approval if and when it gets built and constructed properly so multiple steps have to happen here uh, but ultimately they have to prove for our code as well as the fema that they're not increasing the vertical height of that flood nor the horizontal distance of that flood. And so far, based on the initial information, you know, we've done our initial review of that. That's the case in both, both situations. That flood height gets dropped, that flood width gets narrower. So positive step in the right direction in that regard, in addition to the improvement and the maintenance of that culvert. So, so has that preliminary study been been done in conjunction with what West Goshen's doing, no. what Rubenstein's doing? This would, no, they, they stand alone. 
Uh, like we said, Don had mentioned maybe a regional type study, which is a great idea. We gave him a proposal for, which I would love to see you guys budget for 25. Um, but these projects are done more in a vacuum on each individual site. Um, and ultimately they're not really interconnected that way. It's somewhat kind of counterintuitive, uh, but that, that's how the project process works with, with FEMA. That's, for me, that's where the challenge is, right? Yep. We're, we're, we're not making it worse. So we say, we're, but we're also not making it better. We're making, I would argue that we're making incremental improvements. Now, I think it's fair to say we are making aspects of the system better, uh, both the Rubenstein site, this site, if they were to be implemented, would be absolute improvements to the Goose Creek uh, system. I, I would argue that you haven't made it better, particularly with uh, Leslie Pinckney Hill, because before it was a big field, it was grass, it could absorb the rain, it was sloshy, but it absorbed much of the groundwater. Now that water sits on the surface and, and it goes into garages and it goes into the street and it goes into other buildings uh, in the neighborhood basements. So no, not yet, we haven't made it better. But to answer, I just have two questions for you, sir. Um, one, would you, have you reached out to West Goshen or Westchester U in terms of their projects is my primary question, or would you be willing to if you have not? And B, are, have you done the testing that they have done? And if not, would you be willing to? Yeah, and I, and I did reach out to the township engineer of West Goshen and spoke to him about that call work because I was interested in what they were doing. I was like, were you, you know, I didn't really think going back there a lot that there's much room for them to add. So they're adding a slightly bigger culvert, but it's not all it's going to really achieve for them is that it will be an easier thing to, to, to uh, maintain and it will take some extra water off the street. And the biggest concern there, as you probably all know, is that that's the road that goes to the hospital. So they don't want that area flooding. So they don't have the opportunity to completely keep the stream in cased in the culvert because there's just not enough physical room. There's not enough height but they'll keep a little bit more water off the street and then the ambulance can, can go through there. But either way, it doesn't have any effect on our study or what's going on. Cause it's not that it's adding, it's not conveying more water down. It's just going to basically take some more water and keep it in the culvert and have less water on the surface. But like I said before, as soon as that culvert gets overwhelmed, then we're faced with surface water being the only way to convey the runoff. That's why we see the flooding on the streets. Did you, did you answer my second question? Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely coordinate with Brian about what they do and the size of it. But and that nothing's been done. They, all they did was apply for a grant. So they, if, if they don't get a grant, there's no project. So they were just applying for a grant to then hire an engineer to do a design. So that's uh, the only conversation they've had to date. There's been absolutely no design and it won't be the in-house engineer. It'll, they'll hire an outside expert. So if you do get this grant, you'd be willing to do that that uh, other test, okay. Okay, yeah. so I think we're underselling what this project can do by itself, okay? We, we can't connect all the flood elevations upstream and downstream, but they can size the culvert through there so that it does not adversely impact the floods. So, so we've got some corrugated metal pipe in there and I see you've got a box culvert that's proposed. Well, they can do their little drainage study to say, okay, we know we got so much water coming from upstream and this is sized appropriately so that it does not increase the water level. So standing alone, this project can can design be designed so that it does not adversely affect flood elevations. So it's I think it's better than what we thought. Yeah, and I would I would just sure. agree. Yes, I would agree. And, and we do show by calculation that Nate had indicated they review. We do show that we do lower the flood elevation compared to what it is today, and thereby also narrow the flood elevation. So it is improved. We just don't have the ability to take it all underground. And and just just. Just further to that point, I talked earlier about the fiscal impacts. Th those did not include, like the this culvert improvement that goes with this project, in and of itself is probably about a million dollars. So you're talking about significant infrastructure improvements in addition to significant fiscal impact that would give the borough the ability to continue to deal with some of these issues moving forward um, once the project is is completed. So. With all of that, if you have any further questions, we're happy to answer them. 
But the, at the end of the day, the bottom line is we're looking for your support for this project for the reasons that we reviewed tonight. Thanks for giving us the time to Thank you. present it to you. One question, Mr. Howe. Mr. Denny Howe, I got one question from you. Yep. Since you're working on this project here and you're making sure that the, the, the floodplain is shrinking, and you've also done Rubensteins, okay, for, for us or yes. for the developer. Uh, have you looked at the increased flow from uh, Market Street down to uh, Rubenstein to see if it's large enough to accept for, uh, a lot more water than it currently is? Well, there's no increased flow, there's decreased flow. Okay. Luckily, so and that's you know by virtue of your ordinance and what we're required to do, we can't. I can increase the flow that's going down there, so there's less flow. You know, we didn't. Pete had gotten. Oops, I guess I'm offline here. I think I think the battery. We have the stormwater management area that's within. Where are you trying to go? Just go backwards, back to the to the amenity area in the center of the of the building, that's green. There you go. Our, our stormwater management is in this open courtyard. So where today there's really zero stormwater management out there. We'll, we'll detain and manage the runoff from our new impervious surface while we're then also simultaneously conveying that water down through. So we're, we're, we're not allowed or permitted to increase the amount of runoff downstream. So with there being less obstructions and better conveyance, then as it goes down through Rubenstein's, it will be less water. Thank you. Any other questions? Thanks very much. Appreciate Thank it. you very much. Have a nice evening. Okay. Item number six, old business. Item A, approve the July 16 and 17, 2024 Borough Council meeting minutes. Any comments or questions? I can consent that. Uh, Number seven, new business from Borough Council, August committee meetings and other new business. Uh, item A, administration, communication and technology. Yes, yeah, so A1, the first item here is a motion to amend the open records request policy. Uh, currently we get a flood of, of um, right to know requests that uh, either are anonymous or generated by bots. And this uh, amendment would um, change the intake process for those right to know requests to eliminate those two problems and reduce administrative expenses significantly. Okay. Um, this was a 3-0 committee recommendation to move to the uh, consent agenda. Any questions? Consensus, move that to consent. Okay, item two. Yes, the next uh, item here was um, Motion to direct the solicitor to prepare a draft ordinance to create a Westchester Borough Transportation Committee. This has been discussed a couple times uh, in council and in work sessions, and a couple times also in the Act Committee. Um, it, this was kicked back to Act Committee last month to answer a couple questions. Um, the first question was um, regarding circulation, circulator buses from Westchester University. To understand whether or not residents would be allowed to use those buses initially when this was proposed, residents were told that we could also use those because they were circulating through the neighborhood based on contractual liability and safety issues. That's not the case. So they're, um, they're essentially exclusive um, or only inclusive to Westchester University uh, students. Um, the second question was regarding the um, committee that we already currently have, which is the Railroad Restoration Committee, um, and whether or not a Transportation Advisory Committee would conflict or how they would partner together potentially, um, or whether w the Restoration Committee, the Railroad Restoration Committee would be dissolved and the work would be picked up within the, the recommended committee here. Um, and the recommendation that the answer to that question was these two committees should both exist but there should be a point person or liaison that would attend meetings of both the Transportation Advisory Committee 
as well as the Railroad Restoration Committee to make sure that communication flow is happening and um, and we're coordinating all efforts. Yeah. So this was a, yep, this was another committee recommendation 3-0 to, to, to move to. Thank you. Questions, comments? Any public comment, questions? Okay, we have consensus to move that to consent. B, the parking committee, item one. This was about um, moving the lot 10 lease, um, sort of phasing it out and moving it to a fully transient public lot. Um, I just wanted to say, I know this says approve a lease, but I, I don't think we don't have a current lease and I don't want to I don't want to create a lease for this. So I think that was, I, I probably should have represented this differently and just said, continue allowance of usage for the three spaces at lot 10 until the leases are extinguished. So if we could modify that, if this forward, that would make the most sense. Okay, good. Uh, motion to schedule a public hearing for September 18th. Amend. Oh, please hold, hold on just one minute. Yeah, so let's let's reword that so we can move it to, to consent. So would be to permit the owner to continue to lease the three spaces at lot 10 for so long as they have contractual obligations in their leases to do so. Okay. Yes. <laughs> the property owner rec advised us that they entered leases guaranteeing those three spaces for the term of whatever their leases are with those three property, you know, those three spaces. And they're, and they're not doing it under any sort of a lease arrangement. They're just obtaining the permit on a monthly basis and paying it on a monthly basis. Okay. We're clear on the language for, for moving it. Okay. Thank you. Isn't it important that we know those dates? So when those leases expire. I, I'm not sure if Mr. Nagel provided them, but we will get them. I know we did the same thing for the Cheston house and we do have those dates as well. So, and we did ask for them so we can make sure that we obtain those. And when we document that we will have those dates listed. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions on that? Re rewrite and uh, put that on, on consent. Item two. A motion to schedule a public hearing for September 18th for amendment chapter 10467 vehicles and traffic. Um, this is about the meters and more consistent enforcement hours for borough owned lots. And it was 3 0 recommendation. Okay. Questions, comments from anyone? Any public comment? All right. Consensus. Move that to consent. Item three. Motion to approve the Chester County lease for Gay Street lot number six and to discuss renewal with the County of Chester for 79 spaces at the current market rate of $95 per space. Currently it's 60. Again, 3 0. Thank you. Questions, comments, public comments, questions. All right, we can move that to consent, please. C, Public Works Committee, item one. Good evening. Uh, we discussed the, the totes and dumpsters in chapter 62 in the borough because there's a plethora of trash cans that are not designated totes. So what we did was we met with uh, the director of the uh, president of the apartment association, uh, the committee did, and we're gonna come back and present to our solicitor our recommendation to, that we can amend chapter 62 at a later date with better verbiage and, and because totes are not mentioned at all. There's the picture. Totes are not mentioned anywhere in the uh, uh, 62, as well as storing the totes after they've been the trash has been picked up. So we're going to uh, we're going to work as a team and come back another month or so and uh, ask that uh, we revise Chapter 62. Okay, so there there's no vote to be taken here. No, to we're, we're going to move have it, it moved to move September. This September, yeah. Okay, item two. Item two, um, the, uh, there are going to be five different vehicles uh, going into enterprise leasing. 
uh, three patrol cars, one car for the police chief and one car for public uh, the parking department. And that was, uh, we're going to be putting them through enterprise leasing. Uh, Mr. Edwards presented it to us and, uh, we recommend that we, we move forward because it, it takes almost a year, year and a half to get the vehicles. Mr. I, Flynn, I'm showing 4 vehicles. There's a, a C lease 225 Explorer. We have uh, three interceptors and a Nissan Leaf. So you got three interceptors, one for parking and one for the chief. Okay, thank you. That's right there, okay. over to your I, left. I just, I think, uh, I think we're right with the number of five, as, as five. Okay. There is a, a electric vehicle for building and housing, a Nissan Leaf. There are three vehicles for the police department. Two of them are patrol. One of them is either detective or admin. And the fifth vehicle is a truck for public works. That will be 350. Well, well, here it's uh, here. It'll it says uh, to handle. It says a Ford Explorer. Yeah, I, I'm showing a police interpreter and Ford F 350 Ford Explorer and a Nissan Leaf. Yeah. Under uh, 1382, it says uh, three, three cars. Police administration gets three of them. The chief gets one and one goes to parking. Mr. Edwards, am I making a mistake on that? So that's what's in the attachments. There's the one for the chief, I believe, the, the, uh, the explorer. Uh, it's my understanding it's uh, three for the police department, one for building and housing, and one for public works. And um, I, I believe all of the attachments were uploaded for the committee, and I assume they were uploaded here. The, so the Explorer is actually going to building and housing, that one, even though Josh Lee's name's on it. Right there. It's up on, it's up on the wall. Oh, Explorers are police cars. Okay. The F-350 is the public works car, and the Nissan Leaf is the building and housing car. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's no, no, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I had thought there were there was four, so I missed yeah. the other Explorer then. It's the, there's five total. It's exactly what is true. Yeah, uh, there's five total. Yes, there is. We know there's an electric car going to parking. Yeah. Right? And we know we got three police cars. Yes. That's four. Yeah. Which one's going to building and housing? I think it's going to be the Nissan Leaf going to a uh, building and housing. And then the F-350 is going to be, end up being the litter truck for public works and the interceptors are going to the police department. There you go. Got it. Perfect. It's all done. Thank you. Any other questions? I really uh, I totally confused everybody, but thank you very much. No, no, I, I didn't know because I, I, I had on my notes just one, but yeah, cause the, uh, 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 when, when I see the truck, no uplift included for, for litter. I, I just assumed that was something else. So, okay, but we got that straightened out. Um, and the next one was the uh, next gen HVAC maintenance agreement. Okay. So we're good to move to, to consent, please. Thanks. M3. Yeah, it could take uh, uh, almost over a year to get the, the vehicles or close to a year. So. Uh, motion to approve uh, amendment to next gen HVAC maintenance agreement. Uh, we use that right now in Borough Hall, and they want to continue it uh, down at Taylor Run as well. Questions, comments? I, I just think we get some efficiencies out of using the same contractor that was one of the that was one of the benefits of, of moving to this agreement. Any public comment or questions? Thank you. Looks like we can move that to consent. Public safety, events and quality of life committee. Sorry. <laughs> really, we just had um, approval of special events. So unite for her the 5k. It's a returning event. Uh, we had Fiorenza's who has. Um, graciously taking over the chili kickoff, uh, cook off, 
Um, so that will be happening uh, in the fall and then uh, Oktoberfest Beer Hall, which is a new event, uh, was all approved 3 0. Thank you. Questions or comments? Public questions or comments? All right, looks like we can move that to consent. Um, number two, the Civil Service Commission. To um, the police, uh, the police department is not fully staffed, so we'd like to start the civil service um, testing again, uh, and that also was approved three zero. I think we have a full full forty four, and we're at forty one. Questions or comments? Any public questions or comments? All right, looks like we can move that to consent. Smart growth. All right. This uh, motion was to direct the solicitor to draft uh, amendments to Chapter 112 zoning and Chapter 97 subdivision and land development ordinances, preliminary subdivision submissions and definitions, building height. So, um, if you recall, a couple of months ago, we were provided a recommendation from the Planning Commission regarding. Um, how to measure the heights of new developments and um, the questions came up just to make sure that our, our team understood what these directions were. And so both Sean and Sally went to the planning commission meetings, talked with the, the team there, the, the committee members and, and got a better understanding of, of what they were proposing and they, they're good with it. They. Sean gave us a thumbs up last meeting. Can we get another thumbs up? Okay. <laughs> All right. Good. Good. Thumbs. So um, the the idea is that there would be a midpoint. Um, depending on the slope of the the property, there's a midpoint of that that street, and you would start the measurement from that midpoint, and then the building would the height would be measured based off of that one point in time as opposed to right now we're doing like every foot or something i don't remember exactly but every how many feet every 10 feet yeah so so technically you could have a building if you're on a steep slope you could have a building that is actually taller from a if you're standing on the end the building itself could be taller than our rec our foot height because it's being measured actually from the middle of the street, not the bottom of the street. But on the other end, you could have a building height that's actually, if you're standing there, technically shorter than our height because, again, it's measured by the middle of the street, not the top of the street. But what that would do is kind of create a level playing field of the building height and the goal being to try to match up with the building surrounding it. Did, it, did I get that? Uh, did, did, any more that you want to add? <laughs> Am I missing something? This is a this is a great example of how difficult it is to interpret uh, zoning language because it's very difficult to put these spatial concepts into words, and then your zoning officer takes it and interprets it. Um, my the way I think about it is a reference plane, a flat reference plane, is established for every site at an elevation that's somewhere in the middle of the high and low points of the site. And from that flat imaginary plane, you measure up whatever the dis vertical distance is in the zoning district. Some districts it can be 45, some districts it can be 75. And no part of the building can protrude above that imaginary reference plane of building height. So Nicole is correct. On the down slope sides of sites, you might be looking at, you might experience a building that's a little bit taller than the building height limit in the district. And when you stand on the uphill side of a slight of a site, you would experience the very same building is looking shorter than the building height limit in the district. But we, as a committee, we're good with it. And so we're recommending moving forward. Any questions from anybody else? Any public questions or comments? All right, we can move that to consent. And uh, moving on to finance and revenue committee. Yes, motion to approve the fine contribution 401A plan amendment. Uh, this is as, as a result of the auditor general's findings by removing loan plan loan 
plan provisions in the defined contribution plan. That was a 3 0 recommendation. Comments or questions. Okay, public comments or questions. And move that to consent, please. Item 2. Yes, item two, motion to sponsor the Westchester Downtown Foundation Preservation Awards, uh, which is taking place on October 17th at the Chester County History Center. And basically, this goes to projects and individuals that have been awarded to maintain the historic character of Westchester. I, one question, is that a, a financial sponsorship or in kind or what we, we we've done this before and yeah. our it's a yearly thing that's in our comprehensive plan um, so tr in the past traditionally we have um approved this year after year and this year it's a financial donation of 900 dollars. great thank you very much any other comments or questions public comments or questions move that to consent please item three A Lincoln SUV. Does somebody need to charge their car? Yeah. We have two more motions, uh, you know, under finance. Let's get yes, uh, motion to approve purchasing request. Uh, Delaware Valley, or excuse me, Delaware Environmental Construction Services. Uh, that is for the spring tree planning, $26,115. Item B, Horgan tree experts, $10,280. That's tree pruning in parks, historical uh, society and um, other places. Uh, Universe solutions, 13,155 and 25 cents. That's soda ash removal at Taylor Run. USALCO, $12,540. That's phosphorus removal and enterprise uh, leasing schedule, uh, which we've already discussed for the five cars. Uh, that was unanimous 3 0. Any comments or questions? Public comments, questions. All right, we can move that to consent, please. Is there any other business? Yes. So I just went to. Uh, Westchester's night out it had to be rescheduled and I'm taking a page out of Dana's book and I brought us each of you pretzels back. <laughs> I, I wish you had that earlier. You waited till the end. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other business? The time you should get one. Yes, Aaron. Okay, seeing none, we are adjourned at 758. Thank you.